um, Adrian did say that that he was going to be potentially running in at the last minute. I'm just going to start with the introductions and um, we can move through. Um, the first thing to say is obviously it should have hopefully popped up on your screen, everyone who's attending, that we are recording this. That's because we've kept this um, event to attend in person, uh, limited to Green Party members. And the recording will be available after the event um, on uh, YouTube as has happened with other uh, meetings. So if you don't want to be visible on the recording, uh, please turn your cameras off and please sort of um, adjust your name accordingly um, so that it, it's removed and not visible. Um, and that we're gonna leave as a matter for yourselves how you want to approach that. Um, the chat is gonna be enabled through the um, hustings, the reverse hustings, um, but because we've tried to keep this to an an hour maximum, we're not going to answer those direct questions. What we will do is look through the questions that come in and they will form the basis of further um, commentary, advice notes, articles, et cetera, that Greens for High Speed 2 will publish going forward. Um, I'm sure you appreciate that everyone has got very limited time and we wanted to keep things on track as much as possible. Um, I'm also just going to flag up just before we even get around to introducing himself that we have got an industry expert with us tonight who will introduce himself, but he will be leaving before the sort of close of business. So don't be concerned if he disappears. Um, what I will sort of set out is that this is a reverse hustings. So we've invited um, all of the candidates to submit questions and to be with us tonight. The reverse hustings part is that they have put forward the questions and our panel who are about to introduce themselves will be providing the answers. The candidates who are here will be given the opportunity to have a comeback to the panel to uh, ask a follow-up question that will be answered. Um, and that will be, they won't know what the follow-up question is. We have seen the questions just for the fact that we anticipated there may be some overlap with questions. So we asked everyone to submit two so that we could check that there wasn't going to be duplications of questions to make it the most informative and the best event that we could have. Um, as I say, all of the candidates were invited. Um, very sadly for us, Amelia and Tamsin had prior engagements, but have specifically wished us well for tonight and have provided a question. And the follow-up question will be made, uh, will be opened to the other candidates to um, jump in and ask the follow-up on their behalf. Uh, Martin and Tina were not available uh, also tonight and they haven't provided a question so there won't be a question from them. So what I'm going to do is hand over to the panel they're going to give you a quick 30 second introduction of who they are um, and where they come from so if we can start with you Alexander. Uh, good evening everybody my name is Alexander Sands. I'm a member here in the wonderful Brighton and Hove um, that's and Hove um, I joined Greens for HS2 in the beginning of 2020. Uh, I have not always been pro HS2, mostly because I didn't know anything about it. Um, and I generally work uh, either creating videos for various Green Party campaigns. Um, I'm a member of the Transport Policy Working Group and I love all things active travel. Thank you. Um, Phil? Uh, I'm chair of a charity called uh, Protect Earth. Uh, I've been a Green member for about a year. Um, I'm from Bath. I live on my bike and I cycle around uh, working on reforestation projects all over the UK and uh, around Europe too. Um, and yeah, um, I'm interested in HS2 because I feel the need for us to slash our emissions because not everyone wants to cycle around on a bike everywhere. Thank you. Um, Adam? Thanks, Bill. Uh, hi, I'm Adam Turner. I'm the chair of the North West Wales Green Party. Um, I work as a town planner with expertise in uh, transport planning, town planning, clearly, <laughs> and urban design. I, too, have kind of progressed from being pretty agnostic about HS2, I'd say, to being pretty much in the pro column. I've also been a Green Party member since the day after the Brexit referendum. Thank you. Um, Steve? Hello, yes, I'm Steve Caldwell. I'm the group leader of Solihull Green Party, um, although I should stress that I'm not here representing them today. I'm, I'm here purely on my own cognizance. Um, 
yes, I've been involved in Greens for Ages 2 for quite some time. And I think like everybody else on the panel, I started off really quite anti-HS2 because I didn't understand what the point of it was. And it was through uh, exploration and through talking with people who I recognised knew more than I did that I, I came to change my view and find myself where I am today. Thank you. Rosie? Hi everyone. Um, I am also a Solihull councillor. Um, I will. I will save you trouble of me repeating the same origin story that everyone else here has. Um, I uh, uh, yeah. Um, I think I came from a, a remarkably similar place, um, and uh, mostly I've come to to recognise that actually what we need in the Green Party is some really coherent transport policy because cutting our transport emissions to, to zero is going to be a big problem. Um, and I think that's where I started thinking about this. And um, I see HS2 as being a part of that, only one part. Um, anyway, that's me. Thank you. And finally, Owen. Oh, sorry. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm not going to be taking part in the panel because I'm going to I'm hosting and monitoring the background things. Um, but just to introduce myself again, it's the same story as, as you've heard over and over it came from a very anti view to um, to listening to a wide variety of views from uh, particularly from the industry and wondering why um, so many in the rail industry were just telling us that our policy didn't make any sense whatsoever. Um, and uh, from from listening to the, to those views, to coming around, seeing how as part of that that wholesale shift uh, to low carbon travel, um, H two is uh, is vital. Uh, sorry, I didn't introduce uh, location. I'm uh, with Trafford Green Party. I'm one of the campaign managers here in Greater Manchester. Fantastic. And then finally, our industry expert who's joining us is Gareth. Hello. Yeah, my name's uh, Gareth Dennis. Uh, hopefully, you can all hear me. Um, I uh, yeah, I'm a design consultant, I'm a track engineer for a, for a big design consultancy called Arcadis. Um, all my work is for the existing railway network. So you'd think I would be opposing HS2 because if without HS2, I'd have a lot more work. Um, but uh, I actually started out as an agnostic, much like all the Greens, perhaps confusingly. I started out as an agnostic fighting, um, kind of having discussions with people who didn't support it has basically led me to most of my talking points, like opposing things like Hyperloop and becoming an MNT nut and all these things started out from people shouting at me about HS2 so the people shouting at me have converted me into more of a staunch pro than you might have expected but um yeah I'm just here as uh, I'm dictionary corner I think aren't I I'm, I'm playing you Susie so um I, I'm I you hopefully won't hear from me at all I'm just gonna be in the corner um and I'll just be fact checking if anything comes up that isn't quite right um and yeah I'll be I'll be ducking out just at the end don't don't mind me but uh yeah that's that's me thanks everyone fantastic and to, to reiterate Gareth is available to any of the um, candidates. I see that Adrian has, has joined us. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, welcome. Um, Ashley, I knew you were there already, so thank you, Sharon. I, I, I'd obviously acknowledge you were here. If there's anything you want to ask Gareth as, as part of your follow-up or for clarification, please just shout. If anything comes up, Gareth is going to raise his hand so I can come to him, and the panel also can defer to him if there's something they want to, to fact check. Um, so what I'm going to do is... Um, very cutely, and if anyone uh, actually needs to see it, my 10 year old daughter selected randomly the order the, the questions that were going to come earlier. And so the first person who came out was Adrian. I'm going to ask the question because obviously I went through and, and picked which ones that we asked, but you're then after the panel have answered, you'll be free to come back with a follow on question, Adrian. So um, please bear that in mind. So Adrian, on behalf of Adrian and Carla, obviously I need to make clear it's on behalf of Adrian and Carla. Um, what is, panel, your response to opposition from environmental organisations such as the Wildlife Trusts over the ecological impact of High Speed 2? Um, so we've got five minutes between us. Adam, I've seen you've unlocked. So do you want to start us off? Uh, yeah, I can do. Um... I guess the first thing I have to say is it's quite an interesting use of the word environmental. Um, I'd say that environmentalism comes in many forms. And I think primary amongst environmentalist concerns right now should be the decarbonisation of transport, given that it's the uh, greatest source of carbon emissions in the UK right now. My form of environmentalism 
is informed by the Green Party principles actually of thinking holistically and also uh, the principle of think global, act local. So in this sense, it's distinct from conservationism, which uh, in my opinion is, is, is more narrow, and I don't mean that in a pejorative sense, and, and tends to be more localized in its scope. So while a conservationist in the Chilterns may well have you know, legitimate and deep concerns about HS2, um, I suppose if we, if we act, sorry, if we think global as well as acting local, we should be similarly concerned about wildfires in Greece, Siberia, Canada, and the Amazon, et cetera. They've all been burning in recent months and they've all been exacerbated by the supremacy of carbon intensive transport in this country. So, you know, if, if your number one priority as, as mine is, is the forging of a zero carbon society for the benefit of woodlands globally, um, then you kind of come to the view that we cannot simply just conserve. Um, there's, a, there's a massive scale of re reorganization that's needed. And as a planner, you know, the reorganization principally is of, of land use patterns, I would say, but also patterns of mobility. So um, it, it, we can't do this reorganization without felling another tree. That's, that's an inconvenient truth, if you like. Um, and to think that we can is dangerously delusional, I would suggest. So again, as a planner, I'm obliged to consider the views of conservationists and ecologists, of, you know, of course I am. Um, but also I need to consider the view of transport planning professionals when they tell us what is needed to decarbonize society and then come to a balanced view about, about how we build that. So this remit, which I think you know, the, the Green Party ought to share, goes beyond the remit, I would say, of the Wildlife Trust or the Woodland Trust, which, like I say, is, is more narrow in scope. And, and let's be clear, if we don't follow the advice of whether it's transport professionals or planning professionals like myself who want to decarbonize society, then the current efforts of conservationists like those in the Wildlife Trust will be in vain anyway, because the fate of woodlands in the Chilterns or wherever they may be will, will match those. Of the, of the woodlands in, in Greece or, or Brazil or Canada. And that, that's, that is my overarching, my overarching concern. Fantastic. Um, Phil? It's all really well put. Um, I think it's very easy when you see a tree being cut down with a chainsaw to think we should stop that. You know, if we can leave those trees alone, then they'll be fine. Um, but that kind of protectionist argument it assumes that climate change isn't happening, right? Um, it's happening all over the world. Trees are being impacted in, in a million different ways. Just the rising temperature stops them from regenerating as well um, and, and stops them from germinating. And we have different diseases and bugs and wildfire, uh, wildfires. And the oak processionary moth, who used to be you know, stuck down in um, South Europe, has come all the way up uh, further north in warmer climates to give us those really bad rashes as well as destroying trees. So um, yeah, the climate change, Without decarbonisation, none of our woodlands are going to survive. We'll see more wildfires and more terrible things in, until they're gone. So um, while it sucks to see trees coming down, it's an emotional feeling when you see that happen. I've seen it firsthand. It sucks. Um, uh, we, you know, we have to do something about it. And losing 0.01% of our ancient woodland in order to decarbonise the most, um, the highest source of emissions in the country um, is a sad but necessary trade-off, in my opinion. And when you put it into context, that is the size of one golf course across the entire country. We're losing one golf course worth of ancient woodland in order to get this important project done. And I, I think that's okay. Okay. Anyone else have a quick 30 second response? No, okay. Uh, Adrian, I'll open it up for you to have your follow up question. <clears throat> Thanks, Mel. And thank you everybody for your considered responses. I, mean, I think it's, really important that we engage, uh, leadership candidates engage with people who are putting forward different perspectives within the party, even if they're coming from a slightly slightly different uh, one themselves. Um, I, I take the point that the um, th that we need to consider overall carbon impact as, you know, right at the top of the list of our concerns in order to address the climate and ecological emergency. Although I do think that you know the climate and ecological emergencies are 
are linked in some way. So it's you can't just look at carbon in isolation. But I don't think any of you were actually saying that. Um, and actually, I, our second question was around carbon impact, and maybe maybe Mel didn't choose that because someone else has asked that question. So maybe we'll hear more about that later on. Um, I suppose on on this one, um, I suppose the question I'd ask as as a follow up is that just looking at the the wildlife trusts statements on this, that they've highlighted that it, you know it's not so much just about losing individual trees. Clearly, any form of development is going to have a local environmental impact and there are always trade-offs. I do accept that. Um, and uh, I, I think the the scale of impact that the Wildlife Trust are highlighting is around the loss, particularly of ancient woodlands, where it's hard to hard to replace in the same way, as well as wildlife reserves and so on. Um, so I, I suppose, uh, and also I think they've highlighted that, that they don't feel they've had the responsiveness from HS2 that they would have liked over the pledges that have been made around mitigating those losses. So any any comments on that would be welcome, including on on whether, you know, is there any analysis that you've seen that you think is robust and independent about the, the overall cost benefit of, uh, that accounts for the ecological impact? And I appreciate this may be a later question, Mel, but I think that's what I'd ask as a follow up. OK, uh, panel, who wants to unlock and jump in? Steve? Yes, thanks, Mel. And um, I'd just quickly take this opportunity to thank so many people for showing up this evening to listen to this. I think oh. it's fantastic to, to see this, this level of engagement. Um, on, on the topic of an independent carbon audit for HS2, I, this is a question that I've, I've heard before from other people. And I'll be honest, I struggle with it a little bit. Um, and the reason I struggle with it is because any project, whether it's HS2 or anything else, um, has to account for all of its activities in order to get to a budgetary position. And that means includes all the material, all the work costs, which means we can see the processes, we can see the resources that are used to deliver that project and that construction. And in HST's case, that's all accounted for and it's all scrutinized in public. So unless someone's going to make the explicit challenge that we think the program is lying about how it's going to be built, and you know you can do that but please bring evidence when you do uh, i i, I kind of think we need to move past that ask because it it, it it doesn't seem to be particularly helpful to me um the other point that i would make about engagement and i think we need to be clear about separating hs2 the piece of infrastructure from hs2 limited which is the the delivery agent for actually getting the thing built now I'm pro HS2. I think HS2 Limited are bloody awful when it comes to engaging with their key stakeholders. And for me, that's one of the things that elected Greens like myself, like Rosie, like many others can do to make it as good as it can be is to hold them to account. That's one of the reasons why I'm on planning committee and got one of their hall routes thrown out of a village in Solihull because it would be seriously damaging to, to, to that local area. Um, that's the reason why we've we've been pushing for better walking and cycling provision at the interchange station in Solihull because that's something that we can do as Greens. And I, yeah, I think HS2 Limited absolutely needs to be held account to account, but we need to separate that lack of performance from the absolute criticality, which is the infrastructure itself. Yeah. Uh, who else on the panel? We've got a couple of minutes left. Wants to jump in, Rosie. I'm just going to jump in with a quick point about um, the uh, the payback in terms of uh, carbon emissions. Um, now, the problem is to understand what HS2 will save us in terms of carbon emissions, we need to know what policy will sit alongside that infrastructure. Infrastructure alone cannot drive modal change. It can't. Um, the only thing that can drive modal change is policy. Um, and that will depend on the policy that the government at the time decides to implement. We can argue that the um, that a conservative government won't necessarily implement the best policies, um, but my response to that is that that is absolutely something that we Greens need to be pushing on. Um, and also the other thing is that policy can change quickly. Um, infrastructure takes years to build. So if we have a different government in 10 years time, and we haven't built HS2, they won't be, then be able to introduce those policies that would give us those dramatic returns on our carbon emissions, such as, for example, banning domestic flights um, that 
could instead be, become a rail journey, um, as we've seen in France, for example. And those are the things that HS2 unlocks, the possibilities that HS2 unlocks. And that's what we need to be pushing for, because otherwise the infrastructure won't be there to make that happen. Fantastic. Thank you, Rosie. Yeah, I'm going to move on to the question from Amelia and Tamsin. Um, so they have asked and said, the Green Party leaders are spokespeople for party policy. Panel, what policies are you excited about for the future of sustainable transport in England and in Wales? Alexander. Cool. Um, so I, I'm a bit of a transport nerd like a lot of other people here. Um, I think that there is a huge future for the Green Party of England and Wales to be a real leader on transport policy, which currently we're not. We've not seen a major update to the transport policy in 10 years. And part of that is due to the fact that the transport policy working group didn't exist for part of that time. And as Greens, you know, the, the, the electoral reality is, is that our battlegrounds are going to be local and regional you know, where a lot of transport, or was it a lot of transport policy change is going to have to happen. You know, so many of the car journeys which are taken are five miles or less. And we are going to have to be moving, or was it we are going to have to be pushing for those to, or was it for those to be taken by walking and cycling? You know, I'm, I'm huge, or was it, I'm hugely enthusiastic about, you know, working on that. The problem is, is the national picture and I think that sometimes as Greens, we can get very siloed into our local, our, our very much local party and the local party issue. And we can fail to see the national picture. So as leaders, or as, as potential leadership candidates, I would urge you to look at the much more national picture, which means actually, how are we gonna get people between urban centers? Because at the moment that's done by car, and that's done by plane and we need it to be done by train and at the moment you know i think that as the green party our transport policy and our transport policy communication is incredibly confused i think that we have seen generations of green party leaders go on the national stage and when asked what is your alternative to hs2 they go no no build hs2 what is your alternative? No build HS2. They don't have any actual alternative or any actual plan. So, you know, I, I'm very much excited to see what the new transport policy working group, because it's been recently reformed, can do. But I'm incredibly excited to see, you know, what you guys will, will actually produce you know as potential as potential leaders and you know the 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 question was it the questioners of this question aren't here um but i would urge them look at was it you know seeing this afterwards to you know to actually think about that because the question is going to come up because we've defined ourselves as an anti-hs2 party with no alternative plan for hs2 okay uh who would like to jump in next adam yeah, thanks, Matt. I just want to echo what Alexander said, actually, which is which is really that if uh, we're looking at end to end journeys, for example, from here in North Wales, if I'm going to go and see family in England, it would be fantastic if I could cycle at one end and then get a train to the other end. Um, and so the, the, there does need to be that integration, but there also needs to the, there needs to be the capacity, obviously, for example, on that West Coast mainline corridor for me to be able to do that as well as many other passengers cheaply and efficiently and you know with a with a timetable that runs to time and and the pro the problems that we have currently is is obviously all the capacity issues on the network but um to answer mel's well not mel's question amelia and tanz's question directly i'm excited about the policy which states that we support a north south high speed rail network in principle um, there is that conflict in our policy, which uh, we, we support the high-speed rail network in principle, but we oppose HS2 in practice. Now, I think it would be incredibly wasteful to rip up HS2 to then construct whatever north-south high-speed network it is we, we would approve of, you know, however many decades that would take to then that, have that on stream in, I don't know, 2050? I mean, it's, I suppose I'm bringing this up just to say that the transport policy suite is not fit for purpose for 2021. It is 10 years old and it does need updating. <laughs> Thanks. 
Um, Steve, we've got a short time left, but I know you had said you wanted to jump in. I did, yeah. I was just going to dive in because I always think sustainable is an interesting word in the context of um, transport policy. Um, and I think that it means different things to different people. And I've, I've spoken about this a couple of times in events recently. Um, and I, I think like Alexander, really, I'm very uh, excited about the, the direction of travel, pardon the pun, um, that we want to take uh, around active transport, because at the moment, a lot of the, the, the response from the establishment establishment parties is electric vehicles. But as we know, EVs cause just as much congestion. They're not perfect on air quality. They do nothing for health outcomes. And an EV will kill you just as thoroughly as a traditional vehicle when it runs you over. So active and public transport is the truly sustainable solution, but it has to be safe. It has to be affordable. It has to be accessible. And it has to have the capacity to be an attractive alternative to getting in the car. And that's where right. it it comes in for rail. Thank you. Time's up. So as um, Amelia or Tamsin couldn't make it, I am going to open the floor to um, Ashley, Adrian and Shara. Whoever jumps in first, uh, would you like to come back with a follow on question? I'll look for who un unmutes first and go with you. Has, has someone addressed either of the questions that I put forward or yes your question is you were you came out of my daughter's hat forth oh. so we will get to you but it's oh. it's open to do you want to have a follow-up question on behalf of Tamsin and Amelia as they're not here um on their question about um sustainable policies and which are the panel excited about um not not really because I can see it's the uh the the, the um restructuring of our transport policy that is in the minds of most of the people on the panel so um, thank you I can understand that adrian i've seen you've unmuted yes um so I'm, I, I'm conscious that the transport policy working group is going to be looking at how our policy overall needs to evolve including as and when hs2 becomes more of a reality and as uh, the question has said, it is it's the job of the leaders to represent existing policy. Um, and I've done that at different times in the past, including as deputy leader, when the policy in favour of a north south line was first passed. And I went on to uh, Radio 4 to defend that. And then HS2 was was put forward and, and we came out against it. And I've supported that since. But I appreciate the Transport Policy Working Group needs to develop this. I suppose the question I'd ask is, um, the, the 2019 manifesto, one of the main rail infrastructure commitments from the party in that was three new electrified lines from Liverpool and Manchester through to Sheffield, Hull and the Tees Valley. So I'd be interested in the panel's thoughts on, you know, wh what did you think about that as, as, as one of our main manifesto commitments in, in 2019 in terms of connectivity within the north of England? And uh, uh, While I've got the floor, I meant to say before, by the way, apologies for, from Carla for tonight as well. Thank you. Okay, who wants to? Alexander, you're waving at me furiously. No, we've we've seen Dictionary Corner go up. I'm we've sorry. Seen the, the, be the beacons are lit. The beacons are lit. Dictionary Corner, over to you immediately. My apologies. Yeah, I've got this Howard Shaw in my us. head now, the grand music and the flames. Sorry, very quickly, uh, I should probably, probably put my hand down. I just wanted to cut in a little bit there on, on Green Party uh, policy that built that manifesto, which um, I think the underlying, although it wasn't in the manifesto itself, the underlying data suggested that Green Party policy to construct that manifesto required a 50% modal shift. Despite an overall reduction in transport, it required a 50% modal shift from or towards rail from, from road. And uh, the only way to achieve that is through, uh, is through unlocking capacity on the lines into London from the north, because all of the long distance stuff that goes to London is the stuff that locks out capacity in the existing network. So I just thought it was an interesting tidbit to throw in, is that the, the, the 2019 manifesto essentially advocated for HS2 uh, through omission. Uh, I thought it was a, a useful point. No, fab, thank you. Um, panel, who wants to jump in? Um, Adam? Yeah, I could jump in briefly. I, I suppose there's a similar argument about uh, electrifying cars, really, which is, you know, if you electrify railways, that's, that's clearly good and it's necessary. It doesn't necessarily deal 
uh, with the with the problems, especially in the north, of capacity. Yes, there will be marginal capacity benefits, as I understand it, with electrification. But what the north really needs, for example, is to, to is some remedy to the Castlefield corridor situation in Manchester, where you've got a ridiculous situation. Gareth will correct me if I'm wrong, where it's two or four tracks running through the centre of Manchester, and you know you've 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 got this two two gosh four would be good, wouldn't it? You know, where, you, where you've got maybe South Manchester on one side, Liverpool and the rest of the North on the other, it's just not good enough. And so th this is what I mean about having a 2021 policy suite. What is the Green Party's position on Northern Powerhouse Rail? We don't know. It's not in the policy. What is the Green Party's position on the fact that, uh, again, I, can't, I haven't got the number to, to mind, X number of miles of Northern Powerhouse Rail actually relies on HS2 infrastructure? And if we cancel HS2, are we still going to build that tunnel through Manchester? Are we still going to build the extra station at Piccadilly? Because, the, 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 yeah. again, talking about inconvenient truths, the inconvenient truth is there will be no local transport revolution in the north anywhere without HS2, both legs, east and west. The Green Party needs to wake up to this. It, it, needs, it needs to, in my opinion, it needs to be a strident voice in favour of the eastern leg, which is, a, which is a danger, it's in danger of cancellation. Otherwise, we are locking in car supremacy, whether that is electric or otherwise. And you know, even even if it's electric, it's just it's just deeply unsustainable. Um, yeah, thank you, Mel. <laughs> um, no, that's fine, Steve. I saw you had your hand up. Uh, I did have my hand up, but I put it straight down again because Adam has utterly stolen my thunder about the codependencies between NPR and HS2. <laughs> um, who else would like to jump in? We've got two minutes left, panel, to answer this one. Gareth, Dictionary Corner. Dictionary Corner is here. Sorry, I, I, I'm saying more than I thought I would. I just want to reinforce that point from a, from a railway technical perspective. Um, the things that you need to do to unlock those bottlenecks in the north, Leeds is a fantastic example. There's no space on the east-west axes of the station anymore. It's, it's packed out and lots of those platforms get filled with long distance trains that sit doing nothing in the time when they turn around back to go back south again. So HS2 is building the T essentially, filling in the space that's Branfield site south of the station to take those trains that stop locking up space that could be used for suburban services and more east-west services and then they'll park them in that t bit so um no matter what you do that's the only way to unlock that uh, to unlock lead station so if hs2 isn't paying for that then that potentially dis you know uh, that potentially disappears so and, and the same goes for lots of locations across the country with hs2 Fab. um phil or rosie do you two want either of you want to jump in Oh. oh, both of you. <laughs> yeah. Right, Rosie, you go as I, as you jumped in. I think unlock quicker. I just saw Phil. <laughs> I was just going to defer to Phil. Um, so I'm sure he's got uh, more to say on this particular issue than I do. Fab, Phil. Consistency. I mean, the um, like I said, it's pro Northwest. Uh, the policy is pro uh, North uh, South Rail. Um, anti HS2 pro east west rail even though the woodland trust came out as being concerned about that impacting ancient woodland there there seems to be and that might even be running on diesel instead of electric um so I, I think overall we could do with kind of figuring out do we as a party support electrified rail um large projects large infrastructure projects if they impact any woodland or if not get rid of all of them because we can't lose any trees right and be consistent with the policies instead of kind of such a case-by-case -case approach when Fantastic. Thank you. Right. Well, yeah. <laughs> so, um, third out of my daughter's very pretty hat uh, was the question from Sharab. Um, and his question is, what circumstances, if any, would stop High Speed 2 from being a viable project? Alexander? Um, so I think... <sighs> I, th I think that it's like it's a double-edged sword that this this like this hypothetical, you know, for high speed two for high speed two to be, you know, you know to be not worth it, it would have to not deliver the capacity benefits for the Midlands and the North and beyond, you know, that it's supposed to deliver, that it's designed to deliver. You know, that that would be, you know, in my opinion, that would be grounds for just giving up at that point. 
But the thing is, is that if it doesn't do that, you're essentially turning around to those communities in the Midlands and the North. And we've got, you know, plenty of people from the Midlands and the North. You know, we've got Adam from Wales, which is even worse, you know, in terms of rail. You know, it's all well and good. Me, sit, me sitting down here in Brighton and Hove, I literally live next to a rail, I was at railway station and going, ah, sucks to be you guys. You know, you've got to deal, you know, you've got to deal with just having got rid of pacers but you don't get a good rail service. Like, you know, when, when I advocate the building of bike lanes, you know, I am turning around to car drivers and saying, get out of your car, get into the bike lane. You know, we can't turn around as a party and say, get out of your car, take the train, but the train service sucks. Well, just deal with it. You know, it's an utterly hypocritical, like, you know, you know it's an utterly hypocritical position to take so you know if it were to not deliver those capacity benefits that that wouldn't be a win for anyone you know that 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 wouldn't that wouldn't be a win for the people in the north or the midlands it wouldn't be a win for those communities because they wouldn't get anything better they'd just be stuck with the crappy rail services they've got um steve i saw you were straight in with your hand i was yes give me a second i'll put it down there we go um I think to answer the question, you have to define what viability looks like. And for me, it isn't a question of cost. I and mean, we, I, I think we're going to come on to the, the discussion about the cost of HS2 um, as we go along. But yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm probably going to rehash some of what Alexander said, but we're currently in a situation where our transport modes are overwhelmingly harmful, both, both our personal travel and, and our supply chains, so how we move around the things that we want or we need to consume to have, you know, decent standards of living. It's all dominated by road and by air at the moment. And that is all hugely injurious to, to the natural world. And HS2 is part of, and well, and high-speed rail in general is part of the antidote to that solution. It's not the entirety of it, but it is a large part of it. So for me, unless something happens that takes the planes from the skies and removes the lorries and the cars from our roads that isn't HS2, then HS2 and, and all electrified rail in general, it's always going to be viable it, because it will always be part of the mobile shift strategy and it shouldn't be about the cost. Um, Adam, I saw you had unmuted earlier. Do you want to jump in? Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I just I just thought I'd echo that viability obviously depends on on cost, but it also you need to you need to be mindful of value, don't you? Benefits, I suppose. You know how how do you quantify the value to me in on the North Wales coast of additional rail services to Crewe and Manchester once once you know those stations have additional platforms? How do you how do you quantify the value? to um, industry here in North Wales, once they're able to send their, uh, their goods by freight on rail rather than being so reliant on the A55, for example. There's, there's no point in a North Walian company sending freight by rail if it gets to crew and then encounters a bottleneck. And th this is the point of HS2, it removes those express services from those main lines so we can do other things with the existing railway. That's, that's the, the key thing that got me to change my mind. But the other, because the general point I would make is if, if a project is absolutely necessary to decarbonize society, which I do think HS2 is, uh, you know, rail infrastructure generally, my, my concern for its economic vi viability is limited in the absolute extreme. Um, I mean, I'd, I'd also add that it's seriously disappointing that Greens have adopted this argument, which I think originated on Tufton Street, which wrongly compares government budgets to household budgets not least in, in relation to a massive revolutionary investment in public transport. So, you know, my understanding is that HS2 as a project will pay for itself actually over, over, the, over the course of its operational life. But I'm not even sure that we should be concerned whether it does or not, because if it's absolutely necessary for a sustainable future, then we should be cracking on with it almost regardless of cost. I'm gonna cut you off just because I'm conscious of time and I do want to make sure we get to Ashley's question. Shirar, do you want to ask a follow-up? I'm not sure if you're able to um, unmute or if you need to do it. Fab, you can. Yes, um, I'm here. Thanks, firstly, for organising this. I think it's uh, so much better than the kind of spats you see on Twitter from time to time. Um, I enjoyed the answer to that question, but I think it just raises several unknown quantities. I mean, for a start, to make 
no more planes in the sky or no more ro cars on the road, a kind of a threshold for making HS2 unviable, I think is probably quite a high threshold. Um, my issue really in that question is looking at the business case, particularly post COVID, you know, people perhaps increasingly wanting to change the way in which they work, less travel, um, and of course, the spiraling costs. I don't really see how that threshold hasn't already been reached, whatever doubts one might have, because there's the principle of HS2, and I, I accept that there is a bit of an inconsistency in party policy in terms of the principle of high-speed rail. Well, what about this project? Isn't that what you're asking for? But then there's the actual project itself and the time and the place in which it happens. And I can't see that that threshold of unviability hasn't been reached. And finally, we've just heard that, well, first of all, no cost um, <laughs> should be a limit given the necessity of the project or well, somebody's going to question the necessity of the project and the time in which it takes to actually pr produce it we're already at last chance saloon in terms of you know the environment climate catastrophe maybe every single large-scale infrastructure project needs to be redirected towards wholesale renewable energy so i don't pandemic cool what I'm going to do, if that's OK with you, because there are a lot of your points roll into um, the question that Ashley asked, if I can ask Ashley's question as well. And then if the panel, I see I've got hands up all over the place, if the panel can pick up the uh, follow on from Shara and Ashley's question and then we can answer the two together. Um, so Ashley's question um, was due to the coronavirus, the way we work will be changed forever with employees using technology. Sorry technology, working smarter and more efficiently and traveling less. Even before the pandemic, the business case for High Speed 2 offered a very poor return for investment. In High Speed 2's latest figures, even after they wrote off about 10 billion of sunk costs, the returns still remain poor. What is it that makes you believe that High Speed 2 is not an increasingly irresponsible waste of taxpayers' money? So I hope everyone's happy that, to see the, that, that there is overlap between those two questions. Um, Rosie, I'll come to you. Thank you. I jumped in quickly there because um, I'm not the most knowledgeable person when it comes to transport policy. That's not really what I do. What I do is health policy. Um, that's my main focus at the moment. And my day job, I'm an osteopath. Now, this last year, my clinic has been full to bursting with people suffering the physical and mental health consequences of working from home, often in unsuitable conditions. Um, the fact that they're not moving around as much, the fact that they haven't been able to, to get out and about, do things. Um, and I could tell you all kinds of stories about this, um, but it's made me absolutely convinced that working from home is not a sustainable option for most people from a health point of view. And we've seen the reflection of that in that most, uh, road travel is already back to its pre-COVID and uh, back to and then a bit more, I think, than the, the, the pre-COVID um, uh, normal. And uh, we're seeing that with, um, like I said, uh, the, the amount or the relative um, amount of people travelling by, by car compared to train, I think something like between 80 and 90 percent of journeys at the moment take place by car. Um, so even if we want to reduce the overall amount of tra travel, which I think we do, um, I think there are times when that's appropriate, um, even if we want to do that, and even if we want to uh, reduce it quite significantly, um, in, when we're not going to be able to do that and get cars off the road without increasing the, uh, the, the rail capacity. Um, so like I said, the... The, the travel we, we want to think about is not the rail people are currently on the rail, it's the people who are currently driving on the motorways. Um, in terms of, uh, yeah, this idea that we all want to travel less, um, I've said already that I think we should absolutely support that, that's good, um, but that's not a policy, that's a wish. Um, the policy we need to put in place to do that we need to how, how are we going to get people traveling less and that becomes much more difficult um, and i don't think anyone's actually suggested policy which there's any any evidence at all um to support would achieve that um so i think yes we should think about that but we also need rail capacity absolutely um 
I believe Dictionary Corner had a hand up at one point. Gareth, do you want to pop in? Because I'm conscious of time and you going. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, thanks, Melanie. Uh, so uh, I, I just wanted to, a, a few brief things. Firstly, like Green Party policy acknowledges that there needs to be a, between a 50 and 100% uh, increase in rail capacity in the UK. The rail industry says with a unified voice, there is only one way to achieve that nationally. And I suppose on viability, I, I mean, it's a, it's a fair... It's a question I get asked a lot. What point do I stop supporting? Well, firstly, we need to get out of the, the taxpayers money thing. Like, let's just drop that discussion because we're all progressives here. That's just not a talking point we should be following. Um, and the analogy I use is quite a simple one. When you've got a river and you're going to build a bridge over that river, you don't go, how much money do we have? Right, we can get two thirds of the way over that river. You go, right, we need to build a bridge. Okay, how much is that going to cost? And if for whatever reason, like for example, a hopeless pipeline of work run by a terrible government, or I don't know, a chronic skills shortage, or um, zero long-term transport policy for the last hundred years, if you've got those sorts of challenges, then um, it's going to get more expensive than you initially planned. Also, if you have a treasury that makes you want that deliberately drives costs to be completely ridiculously underrepresented at the start of a project it's always going to look like it's increasing. But given that even if you doubled the cost or tripled the cost of, bear in mind that you know, HS2 is costing about two to four billion a year. Um, the NHS budget is 140 billion a year. And, it, and, and the whole point is that it doesn't matter because you know, it, it, taxpayers' money doesn't pay for any of this stuff. Um, tax is just used to bring value back to the exchequer after the fact. So um, that bridge analogy is the key one. A bridge is oh, a bridge is only finished when it reaches the other side of the bank. Really, uh, thanks. That's my bit over. Thanks, everyone. Fab. Um, I will come to Alexander then to Steve. Um, yeah. So just to pick up the point of like you know COVID and people traveling less, I think I might be unique on the panel in that I have to travel to my. Oh no, wait, no, no, Rosie as well. But you know we have to travel to our jobs in order to do our jobs. I work either as a barista or making videos. I can't do my work from home. It's very difficult to make coffee from home unless you're just making it for yourself and then you don't earn a huge amount of money. You know, I, th I think that working from home works for a, a reasonable amount of people, but it doesn't work for most people. But that's just work. You know, if I want to go visit say some mates in Manchester, some friend, you know, some family up in Scotland, I can tell you from experience, and this is the experience of being six months alone in a room on my own, Zoom does a lot, it doesn't do everything. It doesn't replace that. You know, if I wanna go on holiday to the Lake District, I can't do that via Zoom. And those journeys that people are taking, and if you're gonna turn around to those people and say, you can't go see your family because the climate says no, you are gonna have a hard time doing that, you know? But those, those journeys are what people are gonna make. And, you know, at the moment they are done via road, via plane. We need to get people doing them via train. When it comes to reducing the need for transport, I think on a local level, we absolutely have the policies to do that. And that is where the majority of car journeys are made. You know, we can talk about 20 minute neighborhoods and bringing the destinations closer to you, making the transport corridors to those destinations more sustainable. Those are absolutely policies the Greens should be, you know, absolutely pioneering. And there's an absolutely great, you know, uh, layout of how those policies map out it's a country called the netherlands you know you can see 15 minute neighborhoods planned out there where you have five different supermarkets in you know in a 15 minute radius from you at all times you don't need to travel that far to go get food you don't need to travel via car you know you have the public transport you have the cycling you have the walking but when it comes to oh i need to go across the country to go visit my relative you have the train that's what you do. You have the train, you have the bus and you have the train, you know, so you have that alternative to the car. And in the UK, we really don't. You know, that's what we need to be looking at. We need to be looking at this whole panoply of policies that we're just not talking about. Fab. Steve, I said I'd come to you. You did. Thanks, Mel. Um, and I think a few of the things I was going to say had already been said, but I'll just quickly recap. I mean, there are some assumptions in the question that need to be unpacked. And that is that, as I think Gareth said on chat, 75% of the population will not be affected by the home working revolution because they can't work from home. You know, catering, health and care services, construction, groundskeeping, waste collection, 
couriering. You know, that, that's not going to happen from the home. Um, and I think the other thing with flexible working is that it is as likely to induce travel as it is to reduce it. Now, I've got experience of this. I had flexible working uh, in a previous role. And quite often I would spend my Friday working in the place that I was planning to spend the Saturday and the Sunday in any way, relaxing. Um, and, and sometimes I would choose to go away because I could travel on Thursday night and, and work from wherever on a Friday. Whereas had I had to travel on the Friday night, along with everybody else, I may not have done that. Um, there's two, two other points that I, I want to pick up. One of them Gareth's already alluded to. I really think we need to be careful about conflating cost and value. Um, I think Oscar Wilde had something to say about that. Um, and it is true that the economic case, purely on the Treasury's very specific definitions of what forms an economic case, it's not great, but it is still positive. So it does still net sufficient return on its investment but it's the strategic benefits which are also part of the hs2 business case but that the treasury explicitly forbids the department for transport for considering when it pitches for budget that actually give us the big wins um and i just wanted to go back to something that shara mentioned in his follow-up question around the idea of that you know not being able to take all the planes out of the sky france is doing that france is doing that right now because it has a high-speed rail network and it has said that where there is a direct high-speed rail link between two cities, you are banned from flying. So it's going to happen and it does happen. Yeah, I'm going to jump in because I want to make sure Ashley has the same right to come back on yep. his question as everyone else had. Um, Ashley, do you have a follow-up, please? Yes, yes, I do. Uh, first of all, um, I did say working smarter. I didn't say just working from home. I said what, working more efficiently. So it's still not just working from home. There's a balance that can be struck for people who can work from home as and when they feel fit or as and when they want to. I think um, one of the misconceptions perhaps about me um, asking this kind of question is that I am totally against any form of development or infrastructure like this that is going to tear up the countryside and decimate communities and ruin wildlife habitats and God knows what else. I am all for big picture, long term, blue sky or well, green sky thinking. Don't get me wrong. I'm all for it. Always have been from the time that I first started to join the party. However, sometimes you have to look shorter term and you have to cut your suit according to your cloth. Now, you can say that it is worthwhile, it's worth all the money in the world to get this done to, re to reduce carbon emissions, but it's all about perspective. And when the electorate sees that our NHS is on its knees, that there's problems with social care, that their homelessness and unemployment has risen to sky levels, and you're talking about a project that is now three times the amount of money that it was budgeted for at the beginning, then you're asking for the electorate to say, who the hell are the Green Party to tell us that we need this now? And that is my concern. I was dreaming of grids of rail going up north and south, east and west across this country. I was dreaming of having train lines along motorways, taking out a lane and train lines along motorways. I'm all for it, but right now, no. Um, I know Rosie's got her hand up and I see Alexander has, but I actually really am going to put Phil on the spotlight for this one because I know Phil has spent a lot of time on construction sites for High Speed 2 and can give us a really unique perspective of what's actually going on in those areas. Phil, if you don't mind. I'm not totally sure how that responds in, uh, to the questions being asked, but I think I think a lot of discussion is being had around the quality of mitigation and, and the over-exaggeration of the impact of, of these lines, right? Um, 
so when we're getting concerned about HS2, we are always hearing about 108 woodlands being destroyed. That's not true. There's 108 woodlands near the railway line within a kilometer and the noise might upset a squirrel. Um, and so a lot of these things are kind of exaggerated. And so we often ignore the fact that our, our RIS2 is impacting um, far more. Uh, I think it's 54 woodlands are threatened um, purely by the lower uh, Thames crossing, which is just one of the 50 projects. Um, so whenever you bring up the comparison of, you know, uh, well, why are we talking about HS2? Look at RIS2 over there. Ooh, it kind of sounds like um, what about ism, but really I think that the context is important. So um, we're pouring a huge amount of time and effort fighting, you know, um, green people and Woodland Trust and all the a whole bunch of people on the left are trying to fight against HS2 because it's bad and whatever it costs money. There's a lot of other projects that are impacting woodland and costing money that only ever increase emissions instead of reducing them. So that's a bit of a concern. And most of those projects do nothing for the environment. Um, HS2 is, is doing 650 hectares of tree planting, which is huge. We only did 1,400 in 2019 as an entire country, and they're going to try and help to do a whole lot more. So um, I think it's always they're not doing enough or the impact is too big and we're not helping out enough but we're helping out more than <laughs> hs2 is helping out more than than some of these road projects and people will then try and say well the 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 work being done is terrible all of those trees are dead that's just completely not true i've gone around and had a look um the trees are doing fine perfectly normal survival rates of you know 80 percent in some areas 90 percent in other which is industry standard that's why they're packed together quite so close because deer will eat some rabbit will eat some drought will take some that just happens and then you've got a few left uh, to make the woodlands so um yeah i i think we're kind of focused on the wrong projects at the moment entirely sorry my cat started fighting and i went on mute rosie do you want to jump in yeah so um very quickly um because i think somebody else will give us a, a briefing on uh, the difference between capital expenditure and operational expenditure i just want to say I do absolutely think we should be using smarter working to reduce the amount we travel, but let's say we can get rid of half of the car journeys, half of all car journeys by that. We can't get anywhere close to that, by the way, but let's say we could. Um, that still gives us 40% of all journeys being taken by car. Um, at the moment, less, around 10% or less are being uh, are happening by rail. I think it's less than 10%. Um, so that's still four times the amount of journeys that we're currently having by rail that we need to do something about. Um, so when you look at it in terms of the numbers, actually, it's a no brainer. Um, we need to reduce the amount we travel, but we also need to increase rail capacity. I'll pass over to someone else. OK, Adam, you, oh, Adam and Steve, you've got your hand up. Who wants to jump in? I could, I could jump in just really quickly just wow. to just just to say um, uh, if we cancel HS2, there won't be any extra money for the NHS or any other services. And that's because the money has been borrowed on the expectation that the use of HS2 will pay that money back. And which, of course, the NHS won't do. Um, that's that's not why we fund the NHS. So just that's the difference between uh, you know capex and other forms of ex expenditure. So I just wanted to make that one clear. The, the other one I wanted to make really clear as well is obviously we focused a lot about working from home because because of what's happened recently. Um, it's a shame we haven't got dictionary corner anymore because I'm I'm, I'm relying on my memory, but. Um, business and commuting travel it does it does not form as as much uh of the total amount of travel as, as people i think like to think that predominantly uh in terms of miles most travel is done for leisure purposes in this country and uh you know we've run an experiment where recently we have told people that they are not allowed to leave the house unless it's essential and during that experiment carbon emissions were reduced by uh, depending on the figures you look at between seven and thirteen percent what are we doing about the remaining 87? We, we, we can't, it's the bleak future if we're telling people that we're going to, I don't know, lock them down and tell them they can't travel in order to save 13% of the carbon emissions. Yeah. This is what I mean about a reorganization. We need to reorganize the way we travel. I'm afraid that that will actually involve perhaps cutting down a tree or two, but, but it will be worth it. But it will be worth it. That, that is the key thing. Thank you. Yeah. I'm going to jump in. Thank you. Um, I'm going to, um, if everyone's OK, because we will overrun by about three or four minutes, um, invite the panel to give me their 30 seconds, very strictly timed, please, point they'd like our leadership candidates to take away from this evening. Um, so I'll start with you, Alexander. 
30 seconds. Yeah. Um, as well as well as our understanding capex is not opex, definitely. I think I think going back to the point that I made earlier, and that is what is your alternative? Because Pete, like if you if you do become the, the leader of the Green Party, one of the very like from precedent, one of the very few times that you will ever appear on Andrew Marr or you know, or Newsnight or in the Metro, as we've seen today is in the Green Party's opposition to HS2. And I would genuinely, I would genuinely, I implore you, please come with an alternative if you have one. You know, if you are going to oppose the build, or was it, you know, the building of this rail line and more rail capacity, come with an alternative, please, for the love of God. Um, Rosie and Kitten, 30 seconds, please, your takeaway point for the candidates. Uh, so Marmot here says, um, actually, Alex said, Alexander said it uh, um, exactly what I was going to say, that if we're going to oppose HS2, we need to have an alternative. We need to know what we're for instead. And that needs alternative needs to be evidence based. It needs to be um, in consultation with industry experts who can um, back us up on our, on our methodology. It needs to be it needs to be credible um so by all means show us some credible alternatives i'm not fixated on hs2 by any means um, i think at this stage um you know it would have to be a damn good alternative in order to justify uh, ripping up what we've done already but uh, i'm i'm not discounting that there may be one out there but i haven't well, seen jump in nobody there's produced it even with the kitten having a few extra seconds i'm going to stop you um <laughs> steve do you want to jump in 30 seconds. Yes, yes, I do. Um, I'm going to actually pick up on, on, on Ashley's last statement and say that he has a point. Um, I, I think it is reasonable to say, what about all of these other things that need to be uh, considered and thought about and funded and developed? That's why we have something called the Green New Deal. Uh, that is, or should be, our flagship policy as the Green Party for describing how we are going to fix a whole bunch of the societal ills that have been visited upon us by the last century of establishment politics. HS2 is not incompatible with that. HS2 will generate work during construction and operation. It will generate uh, prosperity for those who use it and for those who are involved in building it. The, the, the two can go together and it is an essential response to the climate and ecological emergency. Fab, thank you. Adam? Thanks. Um, I just want to actually thank the candidates for coming, first of all, because you don't have to. And it's really good to see you here engaging with us. Um, we're actually not used to necessarily senior Greens engaging with us. So I do want to actually put my thanks on the record. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, now, now that I've said that, I just want to say that obviously as leaders, assuming that you win, you will be spokespeople for our party. And there is a number of policies that you can choose to promote over others. As a planner, I'm urging you to promote policies that we can still effectively do something about. The, the truth of the matter is, whether we like it or not, HS2 is happening now, the spades are in the ground, and therefore there's actually really limited meaning to our opposition to it because it's already happening. Whereas RIS2, that's the road investment strategy, which by the way is 4,000 miles of road in the countryside, not 383 that HS2 is, that is in the planning stage now that is what we need to be opposing. It's not an electrified railway, we're talking about more polluting cars, more particulate matter from tires and brakes and carbon emissions. So as spokespeople, I would urge you to think strategically about what it is that we're opposing. And I would echo, uh, I would echo the other members of the panel to say, it's not good enough just to oppose, we do need to provide solutions as well. Thank you. Fantastic. Um, right, I'm conscious that we've um, wrapped up, or oh, gone over a little bit, what I do really want to say is just an incredibly massive thank you to Sharat, to Ashley and to Adrian, because this event was a long time in the planning and a very short time in the execution. And it all came together very much at the 11th hour. And I'm incredibly grateful for um, your questions, uh, for your time this evening and um, for you just being here and, and listening to us, um, because that is that's really as a group what we just strive to, to to happen is that we're listened to and that we're engaged with and whether it's one of the the three slash four Adrian because obviously you're here as as part of a double act 
um, or whether it is uh, Martin and Tina or um, uh, Amelia and Tamsin who ultimately win the election, we are here and we are here to talk to you and help you in any way we can as a group. And, you know, our doors are open, our DMs are open, and we are here to support you as leaders going forward. Um, and I hope that you will find that we're not terrifying um, and that we're <laughs> approachable and we're, we're sort of here to help in, in any way we can. Um, I also want to say a really massive thank you to our Dictionary Corner. He's, he's popped off to be live on um, another uh, call, but Gareth Dennis, who is regularly available on YouTube on Gareth Dennis TV, um, is always there to sort of give an insight into rail. Um, I will admit to the fact I've never watched any of it because trains are actually something I find very strange. Uh, although I support them in principle, um, I, I don't understand when they all start talking about different modes of, uh, of engines and uh, track widths and everything else. Um, but in, in principle, obviously I'm here and part of the group and uh, have chaired this evening hopefully with some success. So thank you very much, uh, candidates. Thank you very much to everyone who came with us. Um, and thank you very much for the panel to uh, for subjecting yourselves to scrutiny uh, live on Zoom. So thank you ever so much, everyone. And we'll say good night. And thank you Thanks very to everyone much. that turned up. Thanks for sharing as well. Thanks, thank Mel. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Good night. <laughs> thank See you, everybody. You we'll be here all week. Oh. And could the awesome. panel stay behind for two minutes when everyone's gone, please? <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.